Hi, everyone. We have about 40 to 50 people signed up to come to the webinar today, but we're going to get started and we're also making this into a podcast. And my partner in crime, Mike Pierre, is our virtual events coordinator. So he'll be organizing this and making it into our podcast as well. And then we'll be sharing that out with Misa and with ISS. I'm joined today. I'm Dana Specker Watts. I'm the director of learning research and outreach here at ISS. And tonight I'm joined with Derek Rhodes, who's the director of AMISA. Do you want to say a little bit about AMISA before we get started? Ah, thanks for having me on and good evening, everybody. We're super excited to chat a little bit about international education. AMISA is the American International Schools in the Americas. We have Central America, South America, North America, and the Caribbean Islands. And we have about 65 member schools. We're excited to have a, our job fair coming up in December in collaboration with ISS. So thanks for having us on and excited to be here. Um, what we're going to do is just kind of go through a brief kind of overview of what are the international schools and what does that look like and how are they different? And I always describe the international schools as kind of the best kept secret in international in education. That may not be true for everybody, but it has been for me. Um, and I actually read a book about it and because I love our international schools and I found it to be so great and as, just as a career choice. And so I'm just going to briefly, I'm Dana Specker Watts. I used to teach, I started my career internationally, ISB Bangkok. Um, from there, I was in New Delhi, India. Then from there, I was at Hong Kong International School. And now I work for International School Services here in Princeton, New Jersey. When I first went overseas, my kids were pretty little. This is two years after we went overseas. My daughter was actually only 18 months when we first went overseas. And this is in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. This was them um, right before my oldest graduated from high school, from Hong Kong International School. So they grew up and spent their lives overseas. So you can do this with a family. You can do it on your own. And I just want to give you a quick background on it. Here's the first school that I taught at, at the International School of Bangkok. When I first started thinking about teaching overseas, I literally had applied to the Peace Corps and I thought, Okay, so I'm going to be teaching in a hut somewhere and like I'm going to be like camping out and things like that. Um, the international schools actually have all different varieties of schools in different different buildings, different structures. Um, quite, some of them are quite established. ISB would be one of the older ones. Same with AES in Delhi. The American Embassy School was started by the American Embassy School. Big surprise by the name, but it feels more like an Ivy League campus. And then this was my most recent school, Hong Kong International School. This is just one of the two campuses. My office actually was literally right by those boats. I looked out and looked at paddle boarding and sailboats and water skiing and mountains every single day. It was the best office view I probably ever have in my life. Um, and this was just one of the many of the two campuses that we had in Hong Kong. What you'll see here is um, really, I, I take a look, I'm a total data geek. And so this is some of the data that I look at on a fairly regular basis. So you'll see that this is um, the gray area is the is the spring of this year. So the spring of this year, we, they were projecting ISC research. Um, they do a great job at gathering data that we had 391 schools. We're now they're thinking there's about 334 that are currently being built. And you'll notice the amount of schools, the amount of schools continues to grow. There's been a significant amount of growth um, since the early, early 2000 of international schools around the world. But there's not just a handful, there's quite a few. And our staff, this is where the staff and the students is quite significant. If you look at the fact there hasn't been a tremendous amount of growth of future schools, what's happening is our schools are growing. And so if you look at the staffing, okay, we had 686,000 staff members in our schools just this spring, and now we're already at 741,000. Additionally, you can see the student body has grown. So despite the fact that, you know, we've experienced a lot of influx or a lot of issues because of COVID and things like that, things continue to grow. From there, we also, um, I just want to give you a brief overview on the types of international schools. So I might've mentioned I was a data geek. Um, I did my dissertation on, on international schools and different types. And I kind of found four different types. One would be government schools. Government schools can consist of like lots of different schools label themselves as international, but many international schools find their roots in the international school system. It's closely aligned with uh, the United States government. Um, not all, but some. And some of the ones that 
that are that you might hear about a lot. Um, but the gov- but schools that are considered government schools now are mo- mostly embassy schools, and they the genesis of the embassy schools was to the need to educate the children of diplomats serving overseas. The enrollment is generally limited to students um, whose parents are on diplomatic missions, although exceptions exist depending on the bylaws of the embassy school. So, for instance, I was at the American Embassy School, and although um, part of it was there to serve the American Embassy students, we also serve 56 different countries and students of other embassies within the area. There's also underneath that umbrella the Department of Defense Dependent Schools, the Dodd Schools, and there's also the Department of State Schools. The interconnected nature of these three models can really create confusion for educators and parents when they're searching for international schools for their children. But the unifying factor is the leadership within these organizations mirrors a U.S. system, and they're more beholden to U.S. regulations regarding testing and standards. Um, They may have a little less autonomy regarding their governing body and accreditation curriculum and sources for funding. Then we have for-profit, corporate, proprietary, franchise, and like niche schools. Um, We're actually running a workshop on this right now through our ISS ED Learn Passport. So basically, these are like almost an ownership model, but the ownership model, like in who is an owner can be really different. So it could be an individual, right? Like, so, you know, the Michael Jordan school or something like that, the Mike Pierre school in Haiti, things like that. So it can be a person who really just wants to run a school, but they may not know a lot about running a school. Then there are partners. So Axis Schools of China are owned in partnership with a family run shipping business and an education foundation. And that's a partner organization. Then there's families. The Australian International School in, I think it's Phnom Penh, is owned by a local family. Then there's corporate, and there's corporations or companies. So Shell Oil owns 14 schools around the, around the world. There's also a Dutch-English mix. Um, there's a Mercedes-Benz School in India, those types of schools. Then there's private, public, and equity firms like Nord Anglia, Cognia, GEMS, um, Maple Leaf. And those are another version of schools. Then real estate developers may develop a school such as Oberoi in India, and they own hotels and things of that nature. And then they also develop schools. Then there's foundation schools, which would be like Yu Chung schools in Asia, which were founded in Hong Kong. And then there's membership type schools um, that kind of serve more as a franchise. And those would be like North Dulwich or Brankstone and some of those. Then there's international boarding schools. That is where they function as boarding schools just overseas, similar to the independent schools here in the States. Some models of boarding are quite, there's two models of boarding that are common. Some draw from an urban area because the daily commuting is too unrealistic. And those students spend the weekend with their parents and then return to school just during the week. And then there's others that are more traditional boarding and those make it less commuting would be far more unrealistic because it's another country where their parents are. But then there's the largest model and that's the model we're really going to talk about today. And that's the model we're going to share with you because they're the most prevalent within our schools. It's the nonprofit, not-for-profit international schools. They're composed of expats from multinational companies, government organizations, NGOs, and private companies. Nonprofit and not-for-profit international schools might also include cooperative community schools, foundation schools, contract schools, maybe religious schools, and nonprofit and not-for-profit have autonomy over their governing body, accreditation, curriculum, and funding. Currently, nonprofit and not-for-profit schools are the most frequently found model of international schools that we have. So where are they? You'll notice now, again, this is the gray areas, the fall. And the red area is the spring, or no, I'm sorry, the gray area is the spring and the red area is the fall. So the schools continue to grow. And actually the only area of growth that you really don't see right now in just the past six months is in Europe. Um, I'm not sure what that's attributed to. I didn't dig deep enough on that one, but you'll see that these schools continue to grow. Where do you see the largest amount of schools in Asia? You can find lots of schools in Asia, but I'd also like to point out the Americas, and that's really where we're what we're talking about today with Emisa. There continue to be more schools and more growth in this area, and we really want to help populate these schools with phenomenal educators and give them an opportunity to grow and to share all the work that they're doing. Derek, do you want to say anything about that before I go on? Yeah, uh, definitely. We have criteria for our schools, so 
while the screen shows uh, 1900 international schools, as Dana's mentioned, they vary greatly. Our 65 member schools in AMISA have several criteria. The first and foremost is they have to follow our ethical guidance and principles. That means if we hire a teacher at one of our school, you're going to teach what you've been told you're going to teach and been hired to teach. You're going to get paid what you've been told you're going to be paid and is in your contract. You're going to get the benefits that have been guaranteed to you. Through the course of our history, we've had to remove schools from membership because they've not followed our ethical guidelines as it relates to child protection, as it relates to hiring and supporting teachers. Part of our membership also requires an engagement and support of teachers. I'm amazed at, in my experience that I hear from teachers at times, mostly in the U.S. where I worked in school districts, that the support wasn't always there from the parent community, from the students, the administrators. Our schools are very supportive. So the schools that we represent are all accredited. They all have to be in existence at least five years. That makes us a little unique as a membership association. A startup school of one or two years cannot be in a MISA school. And we have that requirement because we want to see a track record of behavior. How is the school going to operate? Is it going to operate ethically? Is it going to guarantee that the teachers are supported as best it can by ensuring professional development and growth opportunities, et cetera? So that's who we are in AMISA. So we're kind of a subset of that 1900 schools, and that does make us unique. All of our schools are on our website, amisa.us. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Derek. And Mike, will you put that in the chat in case anyone wants to see it? And Derek just brought up a really good point. So accreditation is huge. Now, accreditation is an independent third-party evaluation of an assessment body, which like really looks at recognized standards, and it really conveys a formal demonstration of impartiality and competence to carry out to make sure that like the school is adhering to certain guidelines, right? This serves as a good barometer of quality of a school. It's not always foolproof, but it definitely can help when you're looking at schools. And these are some of the accreditation agencies that might be associated with our schools. Now, sometimes they might be missing an accreditation. And like Derek mentioned, if it's a brand new startup school, they may not have accreditation yet because they just started, right? Or they might be switching in between accreditation agencies, but normally they carry one over until they switch into a new one. But it's something to kind of think about when you're looking at schools and making sure that it's a legit school and not one that's going to be unethical. I've got a few little tips on when you're recruiting with the international schools. So first of all, first and foremost, we recruit now. We do not wait until you know May or June because we need to get you visas and we need to get you into our schools. So it doesn't mean you're going to start now. We just begin to offer contracts now and our hiring season starts, you know, right now. We're going to tell you more about it in a few minutes, but Amisa and ISS, we're having a joint kind of recruiting fair in December. And we start to fill heads of school and leadership roles are already being filled. Teacher positions will be basically filled by the latest, probably January, February. Um, sometimes a couple trickle into March, but because we need to figure out housing, we need to figure out visas, we need to figure out who, how are we going to ship your things to our school and to a new country, recruiting season starts early. And with recruiting, we've got a couple tips and tricks. Uh, tips and tricks. One would be when you're at a recruiting fair, I highly recommend going to one. They're a ridiculous amount of fun and a complete learning experience. But one would be to network with as many people as possible. The more you talk to people, the more you learn about a region, the more you learn about different countries, you learn about different schools, and you hear about why people might be leaving a certain job or a certain location or a certain school or what they loved about positions in the past. You also want to make sure that you do your homework before you start um, recruiting. You don't want to go up to a school and say, oh, whatever, and you realize that you know, the school has maybe 10 teachers and it's in some part of the world that you don't want to live in or things of that nature. So you want to be able to be able to speak to people at that school about the school, what their strategic objectives are and things of that nature. 
You also, when you're at a recruiting fair, I'm calling it phone a friend, but I really think it's important to have someone within that time zone that you can call and bounce ideas off of. Oh, I just got offered two different jobs. What are, you know, what do you think about this? I also highly recommend you phone, you phone someone you don't know. Not really, but I've had lots of people do this for me with me at conferences where they're like, okay, I have two offers. Can I just talk to you about them? And then they'll sit there because you'll get, you'll, if If you play your cards right, you'll probably get an offer right at the recruiting fair. But what's nice is to have someone who knows nothing really about you just listen to the way you talk about the two different positions because they can tell you, okay, you seem really excited about this. I heard some hesitation when you were talking about this, things of that nature. So you can start to think about and really weigh your options. A pro and con list can be really helpful with that as well. I've got the little icon here for a QR code. I recently heard this and I think it's a really good idea is you just take your business card and you put um, a a little QR code on it that connects right to your CV. You're not going to want to walk around with a bunch of pieces of paper and chances are whoever's recruiting doesn't want to walk around necessarily with a bunch of pieces of paper. But if you give them a business card and it has a QR code on it, of course mine does not because I'm not looking for a job. But then your CV is connected to it It's kind of a great and easy way to be able to hand that to people on the fly. At recruitment fairs, we tend to have a lot of presentations and different representatives from the different schools will do presentations about their school. It's a great way, A, to get a feel for the school. Normally, the person who's doing the presentation is head of school or someone, you know, in a senior leadership position. So it gives you an idea of like, what's this leadership look like? What are they trying? What is the message that they're trying to share? And it can give you an idea of what they really value. So it's a great way to do things as well. And then the last thing is to be open to locations. The amount of times we were recently at a recruiting fair, and I saw this line for people trying to go somewhere in Europe. Chances are maybe, you know, 20 of those people were going to get a job at that school. Meanwhile, there was this other great little school that was remote in the middle of somewhere that a lot of people wouldn't think about, right? And so I talked to them in line and I sat there and I said, okay, so what is it that you really want? What are you looking for? And when they talked to me about what kind of leadership they were looking for, what kind of opportunities, what kinds of growth, I was like, all right, so just because in your mindset, you're thinking, I only want to go to this country because it seems like quite the amazing, great place to go to. There are multitudes of countries and locations all around the globe to go to and to think about. And so um, it's a great way to kind of figure out, to open yourself up to different ideas. And when you're talking to recruiters, it's really helpful to ask them questions about the country, potential savings, the campus, housing, benefits, the proximity to other things. Some people like to be near an airport. Some people like to be really remote and out in the middle of nowhere. So it depends on what you're looking for and to ask those kinds of questions. Derek, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I totally agree. Dana, just great advice all across the board. We always advise people to go in open-minded. You know, for us, we didn't really think about Brazil for when my wife and I went. We were thinking about all kinds of countries and Brazil really wasn't on our radar until we got to the job fair and really got to learn more about the country and meet the people. It's also, like you said, getting to know other other teachers at the job fair, people that were actually, you know, had been in the school in Brazil and were deciding that it was just the right time for them to move on after several years there. So couldn't agree more with everything that you're sharing as part of advice. You have to go in with a very open mind and be flexible and, you know, really do the research as Dana's sharing about the school as much as you can. Now with the internet and web pages, you can really learn a lot about the school's on our website, we did put out a recent blog that kind of highlighted the countries and, and cities and schools that will be at our job fair uh, that we're doing with you at ISS in, in Atlanta coming up soon at the American International School, the Atlanta International School. So, yeah, I totally agree. And it's really being open minded and, and thinking about all the information that, that uh, Dana shared. Our recruiting website, and I'm sure ISS has a similar piece to, to their portal once you log in and have an approved and accepted profile, you can get all the salary and benefit information, curricular information about the schools. There's really a ton of information in our, our websites and on the ISS portal. So I definitely agree with the point you're making there, Dana. And hopefully people will think open-minded and be open-minded about the opportunities ahead of them. Also, I would also add, like specifically, I've heard from elementary teachers who 
say, well, I've always been upper elementary, you know, I've taught fourth grade or fifth grade, and can I teach lower elementary? And to be open to that too, because sometimes you'll get a job offer at a school, they say, well, we need third grade this next year. But after that, we always make moves from within internal in the school first before we go outside to external hiring. So there's always possibilities to to change within the school as well. And so I think the bottom line is, is what you said, Dana, it's just really being open-minded and flexible and doing as much research as possible. That's a great point. And I know, I mean, I started off in higher ed and then I started teaching IB when I first moved to Bangkok in IB English. And then I ended up getting really into e-portfolios. And next thing I knew, I was the tech coach. And then from there, I realized, oh, you can't really integrate technology without like looking at the curriculum. And then I became director of curriculum. And then from there, I wanted to do research on professional development because of spending a lot of money on PD and ended up now in my current job. Like within the international schools, you can evolve and change. Like you don't have to go in thinking, oh, I only teach this. And there are multiple times when I've been hired at a school and they're like, well, we want you, but we may not have the perfect job for you right now. And so they might like kind of, you know, scotch tape a couple different positions together to get you there because they want you and then you're there and then you kind of actually figure it out as you go along or you wait for different people to leave and things of that nature. They might know that there's going to be an opening in another year because someone's leaving because their child's, you know, graduating or something like that. So being open to a little bit of everything is actually quite fun. You can be a jack of multiple trades. These are some of the institutional and regional organizations that exist. It's not extensive in all of them, but there are all a bunch of, uh, there are some other ones as well, in addition to AMISA that you can check out, depending on different parts of the world that you might want to go to. But in addition to these, I just had a couple other few little things that I was going to tell you about recruiting and interview process. There are multitudes of agencies that you can go through. Of course, we think AMISA and ISS are pretty awesome because we both work with them and we think they're great. Um, There are other ones as well, but finding a recruiting agency and someone who actually like can kind of help you um, be protect you in case like, I mean, I almost took a job, you know, right out of grad school working for um, a school that was basically just a language school where they were housing people, you know, like in a warehouse. And I was going to be just teaching how to speak English, not English literature each day. That was not something like I didn't know. So you want to try to like look at some of the different agencies. Some of those are, we've been around um, since 1955, International School Services, but there's also Carney Sando. It's been around since 1977, also quite some time. And then of course, Thai, the International Educator, also known as Thai Online, Teach Away, Search, Scroll, RG175. They're all different ways that you can do recruiting. Then in addition to that, there's also, you want to think about time of year, which I mentioned, head of school is happening right now. Directors and superintendents are almost all hired for next year, but then teachers are being hired. That season is is ramping up right now. One other quick thing is questions. You're going to be asked questions that you would never be asked stateside. For example, they might ask you if you have a trailing spouse and a trailing spouse that is used to describe the person who follows their partner to another country with who may not have a position teaching within the school. Um, that So they'll ask you your marital status or your relationship status. That's because they're trying to get that person a visa into the country. But that is a question you would never be asked stateside. They'll also ask you about the number of dependents that you have. The dependents refers to the amount of people that the school will have to provide a visa to, tuition, housing, and transportation back and forth in summer and to the host country. So that's some language that's helpful to know. And then lastly, at a recruiting fair, you'll be asked about your contract. So contracts generally require a two-year commitment, which may include housing, tuition for dependents, and travel back and forth to your home country, depending on the location of the country. You might be asked a little bit, you know, some of the terms that you might hear is co-teaching and whether you're going to teach with somebody else, host country, which is the country where the school is based, or the um. A local hire is someone who may be hired within that country. An overseas hire is chances are how you'd be coming into the country. It's someone who has been hired outside of their their own country where they were born and do not permanently reside within the country of the school. We talk a lot about third culture kids, TCKs. It's a term used to describe our student population. Often, and you'll hear it's quite prevalent in international schools, these students have lived 
outside of their home country and in multiple places around the world that they might call their home. So they're kind of, um, my kids would call themselves that. They're kind of members of many different countries, but they're not really certain which one. And then the last word or phrasing that I hear a lot is tears. People talk about tears of international schools. It's a phrase that's often used to describe the quality of an international school, but it's kind of loosely based, right? And educators might refer to a school as a tier one school. While there's no formal labeling of an international school, some common indicators of what might be considered a tier one school is if they're accredited, it, the size of the faculty, the type of curriculum, and their recognition. Um, some of the some of those schools are recognized by either the State Department or the U.S. Office of Overseas Schools. Okay, Atlanta. So, Amisa and ISS were having a, a recruitment fair in Atlanta at Atlanta International School in December, the, and we're super excited to meet people, and we really are excited about um, working with you and figuring out different ways that we can help get you overseas if you're interested and things of that nature. But we wanted to open it up to any questions you might have, um, and if you and if you had any like questions or things you wanted to talk to us about, we're all ears. And Derek, if you had anything you wanted to add to, go right ahead. Yeah, and it's a small group, so you can probably feel comfortable just to unmute and, and ask your question if you have them. Or you can enter them in the chat if you have any. And if you don't, not a problem. And um, you can email either one of us um, if you have any specific questions, and we can answer them there as well. I wish that when I was younger, I learned about international schools, because if I had known I would have gone overseas much earlier in my career and my life, I've loved teaching overseas. And um, I spent almost 15 years of my career overseas. And I only came back because my kids were going to college and they wanted me a little closer to them because they had never lived in America, but I'd still be overseas now. Yeah, the, the value, I think, of overseas work, first and foremost, is we tend not to re really respect educators in the U.S., especially K-12. It's kind of one of those old analogies that previous generations would say, well, if a teacher called home, the parent's first response was, you know, what did my son or daughter do? They need to be putting their best, you know, efforts forward and behaving in, in school. And unfortunately, nowadays, the adage is more, you know, what did the teacher do wrong uh, as the first response, as opposed to working with the, the educator, the teacher to help the, the child. And I think, you know, just overall, our society in the United States, especially just doesn't value educators. And we're seeing that more and more in today's world. And overseas, the, the cultures that I worked in and in Latin America, they really valued teachers. And that was completely different for just the experience itself. The second thing I experienced was just the, the work-life balance. In the U.S., as a teacher, I was working really long hours, big class sizes. So my number of you know assignments and tests and things I was marking and, and giving feedback on was just so difficult to, to maintain truly formative feedback to students because I just didn't have time to do that. So internationally, class sizes are typically half. And, and so immediately you have more time to get to work with students. Your parent community is more supportive. And not to mention, you're actually able to live comfortably and, and actually save some money. So in the United States, we don't pay educators. We don't pay them. We don't respect them. And, you know, that's a real challenge for us as, as teachers, where when I worked overseas, my student discipline was next to nothing. My parent support was very, very supportive and, and appreciated. My administrator support was very supportive. And partly, you know, Dana mentioned the notion of asking us as, you know, candidates interviewing what's our spouse situation or our dependent situation. It's also overseas. If you get sick, the school is going to help you. You know, if something breaks at your house, the school is going to help you. So for us in, Portu in Portuguese and Spanish and Brazil and, and our Spanish speaking countries, you know, you don't have to speak the host country, the language. You're going to learn Spanish. You're going to learn Portuguese. And people are very friendly and want to help. And we really advise people to, to work and learn the host language of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, but you don't have to know Spanish to operate locally. If you need translation, somebody at the school is going to help you. So it's a different 
familiar vibe. It, the school day doesn't just end at five o'clock for, for us as teachers. A lot of the parents are in the community at school on the weekends. We get to know the parent community very closely. We get to know our, our fellow teachers and educators and our administrators. So it's really a fam, familiar family-like environment. And the travel is amazing. I mean, our, our personal growth is amazing. And I would really say the last thing for me was just really understanding cultural difference and not staying in a place growing up in the U.S. that was so egocentric on our own culture and the way we do things, but really an acceptance of difference. And it's it's quite disappointing in our world today that it seems that acceptance of difference is immediately a right or a wrong as, as opposed to what it should be. And that's just accepting it as different. It, it doesn't have to be like what my experience is, but every experience is valued. And, you know, we're really working to make the world a better place through the work we do as educators and to be appreciated as educators in our schools is, is quite amazing. So I hope this has been a helpful information session. Unless there's other questions, you know, Dana, I think you did a great job covering the information and hopefully people think about joining us in Atlanta. I think Edmund has a question. Edmund, did you want to unmute? Well, Edmund, un- unmute, um, and, and while you're getting your audio going, I was just going to piggyback on what you said, Derek, about the lack of, like, I just didn't have to hit those standardized testing and, like, some of that, like, the paperwork and the minutia that made me really stop love, my love of teaching. And then I went overseas and it was like, oh, my gosh, like, this is, there's so much, I have so much autonomy and choice and ability to, like, really connect with students in a different way. Edmund, are you all set? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yep, we're good. Good, 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 good. So I want to ask this question about certifications with regards to teaching overseas. Most of the times, most of these schools have their own certification. For example, the teacher qualification certifications. These things are diverse. Um, every country has its own. One, does it really matter? Can, can I use what we have here to apply overseas or there's an international standard teacher qualification certificate that is needed. Yes, please. Thank you. That's an excellent question. I So there isn't really an international certification, depending on where your certification is from. Um, if you're certified to teach, you're certified to teach in the international schools. Some schools do prefer certain certifications from different countries. However, that has changed quite a bit in the past two to three years. Um, and I see a lot more, a lot more, I would say like just open-mindedness about like different certifications from different countries and different and different nationalities, but there isn't just one certification. We do, most schools do require some sort of certification though, that you have a background in education, not that, you know, you've done some something else, you want to start a brand new career. You do need um, a background in education of some sort. How about for Amisa, Derek? Uh, we're, we're the American international schools. So we're not the British international schools. We're not the French international schools. So what's going to be important for us is a candidate coming in with experience in U.S. curriculum. That's going to be the the first if they're teaching the the humanities, typically the social sciences, humanities. If you're a math teacher, that's not as big a driver in the math and science. So if you come out of Canada and you've been used to a very integrated program in the upper level maths and you're working in a U.S. school, you can teach trigonometry and calculus you, and you may be doing them more discreetly as, as opposed to integrated. So the curriculum experience is an initial conversation. So I always advise people, if you're applying for a humanities position, part of the courses you're going to be teaching at the secondary level is U.S. history. It doesn't mean you have to be born and raised in the United States, but you need to be able to communicate in the interview process your experience at teaching, the different curricular pieces there. And so it may not be civil war in the United States. I always use civil war as a concept because in the United States, we think about the U.S. civil war. But obviously, there's civil wars throughout history in in lots of different countries. So what are the primary elements of a war, of civil war? Why does that happen in the strife? So from a history perspective, you know, there's certainly things in the curriculum that are going to be U.S. centric in the United States, in Brazil and Mexico, the schools I worked in. There was part of the high school curriculum because they were accredited in the United States that there was U.S. history. 
And so I always use history as an example where that, that experience might bear more, but certainly in the math and science, um, technology, design, thinker, you know, maker spaces, genius hour concepts where you're doing of that kind of teaching, I, I don't I don't think the, the certification matters very much in math and science. You know, math and science is always a place where we're always seeking highly qualified people that can teach the math and science. Because typically, if I'm a math major in college, I get scooped up by industry because the salaries are just much higher in, in math and science, engineering um, concepts. So certification can also play into the visa process. Unfortunately, we all live in countries that sometimes have visa restrictions that are not as accepting and as open as, as others. So we're we're very guilty in the United States of, of our challenges on allowing people in on visas. And, you know, immigration is a hotspot in different countries. So the school is going to need to be able to communicate to their host country. So if it's, for example, I'm going to use Cuba. If you're in Havana, Cuba, at one of our schools, the International School of Havana, and you're not going to get there as a U.S. teacher. They're just not going to allow a U.S. people in. So they hire a lot more Canadians, a lot more people from Europe, Australia. So your nationality and the passport you hold, unfortunately, does impact and come into the conversation when it relates to work visas. Because our, our schools in Amisa are all going to work to get you a work visa. We're not going to bring you into the country illegally and have you work in the country illegally. That, that's not something we can do. All of our schools are allowed to be in the country because the United States has good diplomatic relations with the host country, and we want to maintain those things. So we need to cooperate with their laws. That includes taxes and, and everything that goes along with that. So part of the certification and your experience, your college degrees, all that is important for the school to clearly understand it. So the more you can put in your application to fully paint a picture of, of your experiences, where you're, you've got you know, your preparation and degrees from and your training all helps the school understand because ultimately they're going to turn that into an application for a work visa for you. So just as Dana mentioned earlier about your personal life, you know, how many dependents and all those kinds of things, it does get to more, you're, you're not just walking, you know, across town or heading across town and applying to a, a local school across town. So it's not the same as just a straight, you know, resume and, and that's it. You're moving internationally, which requires a lot more moving parts. So I hope that information is helpful, Edmund. And we certainly welcome your application to the MISA. The link is in the chat. And we welcome you to, to go on our website, fill out an application, and we welcome you into the job search process with us. Eric, I had a quick question. So I'm just wondering, you know, there's all these different regions that you can work in within the international school sector. What's special about Amisa? Because it's like I I love it there. So tell us a little bit for someone who hasn't been to your region. Like, what's it like? Why why do I want to teach in your region? Well, first and foremost, I would say the people, the culture, this, the communities that we work in are very warm, and accepting of people that are not necessarily from there. And so the community itself is safe, welcoming. I think we are progressive in that uh, a lot of the ways we look at women, males, you know, we don't have restrictions on women being able to not be able to drive or have to dress a certain way, you know, very much westernized in that regard as it relates to just living and working in the community. Obviously, the weather itself, a lot of people appreciate the warm weather. We say a lot of the countries, you know, from the Caribbean islands through Central America, South America is kind of eternal spring. So some people really appreciate just being able to be outdoors, be able to hike, walk, you know, run. There's lots of beautiful city parks and just the the communities you live in are very conducive to being outdoors and, and active. The cost of living is relatively low in Latin America. It, it's still a place where you have great uh, travel opportunities and you can afford to to get around and do things. And that also relates to your own personal living style. Some people are really focused on trying to save money, maybe the first year or two and don't travel as much. But we find that most people that want to travel can get around to the wonderful places, whether it's Argentina or the Galapagos Island or Patagonia or Machu Picchu or wherever it might be that you want to get to some of the ruins. There's just wonderful 
culture and history with the Mayans and, and places you can travel and get to that are just excellent. Brazil, the Pantanal, obviously, Manaus, the, the you know, just the beaches, mountains are, are great. And I think just the schools are very, you know, very progressive in their desire to support students and student learning in the very best ways possible and to really embrace the student voice and, and want students to be central in the learning process for our schools. So, and, and you know, this, the teachers that come from the United States, close proximity to home. We're not, you know, a 20 hour trip or something to get home. And so proximity to the United States, obviously we're traveling north and south. So your time difference is maybe an hour to three hours. So you don't have a huge jet lag when you're traveling places. And so just the diversity and the richness of the countries. So our region, you know, really is a special place and Latin America is a special place. My wife and I worked there 12 years. Our two daughters were born in Brazil and they hold, you know, dual citizenship as Brazilian citizens as well. And it's just, we always found we're very embraced by wherever we are in the, in the region. And I've just really enjoyed working and, and being here and supporting Amisa schools. They're just really great places to learn and work. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I know I totally put you on the spot, but, and I think, I mean, especially after, you know, all the things that have happened with COVID and things like that, being close, like you're still close enough that you can go home, but you're not, you know, halfway around the world. Um, It's just a kind of a nice, it's a nice way to be overseas. Um, Do you have a Mesa schools in Africa, Edmund asked? No, we're the only, we're just the Americas. Uh, in fact, we used to be ASA, the American Association of American Schools in South America. And we had schools in Central America and the Caribbean. And so we made the decision to change our name to AMISA to really be more inclusive of where our schools were located. And people think of America, and it's not just North America or the United States of America, but it's really America's South America, America's Central America. So we really leaned into the Americas and, and of course, the surrounding Caribbean islands. So we don't have schools in, in Africa, but as Dana was sharing earlier in her slides, there are schools throughout the world that ISS works with. And I know they have some member schools in, in Africa. So ISS certainly, you know, is a great place to look and to learn more about different continents and, and places around the world. But we're just the Americas, South, Central, North, and, and the uh, Caribbean islands. And I also want to say a point on North America. We're, our focus is really, while the Atlanta International School is a member school, and they will be recruiting at our job fair in December, they will have a table there at their school. So it's a great opportunity to learn if you're working overseas and you think about moving back to the United States, if that's where you're from or want to live, our service includes our member school in Atlanta. And we've only been a MISA for just over a year. So we'll probably have some additional U.S. international schools that want to join. And teacher recruitment's probably one of the, the reasons why they might want to be part of that. So our focus is really Latin America, though. So sometimes we get people asking us about jobs in the U.S., and that's not our, our job service. That's not our focus is to, to bring people to the United States. So I'll add that into the pod podcast and chat too. We're really focused on our schools in Latin America. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions before we sign off? If there's any reason you think of any questions afterwards, um, you're welcome to email me at dwatts at iss.edu. And if there aren't any further questions, on behalf of AMISA and ISS, we thank you all for joining us tonight. And we love teaching overseas. We highly recommend it. And we'd love to have you join us. And we'd love to see you in Atlanta. We've got two fairs going on, one for AMISA and one for ISS. And come join us, learn about the schools, and, uh, and start your next adventure. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. And, and remember, these two fairs are, are a great opportunity because there's no additional cost for you to join either fair. You can come through AMISA, you can come through ISS. You don't need to create a, an additional file. Um, AMISA and ISS will share your, your candidate profile, which we happily do between us. So no extra work on your side as a candidate. Hopefully, you can, we'll see you in Atlanta. Great. We hope to see you there. Somebody's asking for the dates. Um, December 9, 10 is AMISA and 10, 11 is ISS. Yep. All right. Take care, everyone. Stay Thank well. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.